Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second lecture of the Reading the Past series organized by Paraspar, Office of Communications, Indian Institute of Science. Today we have Professor Rajan Gurukul who will be uh, speaking on Gandhiji's struggle against British imperialism, a reprisal in the context of decolonization. Uh, before we begin, I would like to give a short introduction of Professor Gurukul. Professor Rajan Gurukul is a well-known so social scientist, historian, educator, and author. Presently, he is vice chairman of the Kerala State Higher Education Council. After completing his doctoral degree, he joined the teaching faculty at the Center of Historical Studies of Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He is former vice chancellor of Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotayam, and Sondhya Rajan visiting professor at the Center for Contemporary Studies, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He has published widely on socio-economic context, uh, cultural history, structural anthropology, historical sociology, and human ecology of the Southern Western Ghats. His latest, latest books include uh, Social Formation of Early South India, published in 2010, Rethinking Classical Indo-Roman Trade, Political Economy of Eastern Mediterranean Ex uh, Exchange Relation, published in 2016, History and the uh, Theory of uh, Knowledge Production, uh, an Introductory Outline, published in 2018, History of Kerala, Prehistoric to Present, published in 2018, co-authored with Raga Bavaria. We are very happy to have you, Professor Gurukal, and over to you now. Thank you so much, Videshna. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, as already announced, a reappraisal uh, of Gandhiji in the 75th year of decolonization. Uh, Gandhiji, as you all know, fought against imperialism, though never talked about colonialist and decolonialist strategies as such. But in the sense that the term decolonialism or decolonization means the process of relieving the colonized from the colonizers' power, economy, technology, and material culture. We can easily say that Gandhiji spent most of his lifetime for decolonization. And the term imperialism was originally introduced into English in its present sense of colonialism in the late 1870s by opponents of the allegedly aggressive and ostentatious imperial policies of British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. The word decolonization was first coined in the 1930s by a German economist, Moritz Julius Born, who lived between 1873 and 1965. Uh, he used the term to describe the liberation, um, liberation of or emancipation of colonies to self-governance. Now we get a better idea about the depth of decolonization from African writers. It was Chino Achebe who lived between 1930 and 2013, Nigerian novelist who unveiled the complexities of decolonization. Now, in his Things Fall Apart, published in 1958, Achebe tells the story of a culture on the verge of change involving the complex problems of decolonization. Likewise, Franz Fanon, uh, a famous West Indies, I mean, French West Indies psychiatrist, uh, who I, I lived during 1925 and 1961, provides a psychological and psychiatric analysis of the dehumanizing effects of colonization upon the individual and the nation, and discusses the broader social, cultural, and political complications of decolonization of a people uh, in his book, The Wretched of the Earth. Wretched of the Earth is very famous. It was, pub it was published in 1961, the year in which he died. Uh, similarly, Ngugi Wa Thiongo, a Kenyan novelist and post-colonial theorist, writes in his collection of essays entitled Decolonizing the Mind, 
the politics of language in African literature, published in 1986, about language and its constructive role in national culture, history, and identity. And therefore, according to him, decolonization means linguistic and cultural decolonization or linguistic and cultural emancipation of people. Academics have always debated the meaning and scope of decolonization extensively over the different uh, over the difference basically uh, in, in the semantic implications. But anyway, we find their definitions converging on the consequences of imperialism. Uh, they all uh, wanted to relate it with the political liberation. At the same time, they all knew that it was not just political liberation, but much more than that. Now, the debate continues as thoughts on post-colonialism today. There are many studies on post-colonialism as well. Of all, Leela Gandhi's post-colonial theory, published in 1998, uh, is perhaps the most relevant to our context. Uh, Leela Gandhi is the first to clearly map out the field called post-colonial decolonizing uh, studies. And it's wider philosophical and intellectual context. Uh, talking about the whole genealogy of philosophizing, starting from Marxism, then post-structuralism, post-modernism, feminism, and, and, and down to post-colonialism. Uh, she analyzes the contribution of Mahatma Gandhi and Franz Fanon, the author of the Rajat of the Earth I just mentioned, uh, and various other theories, such as Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, and Homi Baba, to the perception of post-coloniality. Uh, Gandhiji's understanding of decolonization was amazingly complete. Now, this I am saying in delight of the studies already made today in the field called decolonization and post-coloniality. We have to reread Gandhiji today to understand the difference in what we have been practicing over the past seven decades and four years and see where we are now. now we are actually between two worlds today. Forget about the progress of decolonization. One world is that of rationalism, and the other that of the bizarre thoughts and imaginations. Now, one world teaching science is the answer, and technology is the future, while the other making vainly hope in us for gadgets to solve all the humanity's problems. But in reality, we find people mad after blitzkrieg for wealth and power. In order to fathom the depth of decolonization in Gandhiji, we should understand his concept of liberation, political strategy, nature of struggle, and the ultimate goal, which certainly vouch for the still unfathomed depth of Gandhiji's understanding. We know that all struggle for independence in the world were violent and bloody. All their freedom fighters had fought against the alien people and their country. Gandhiji's concept of liberation meant total emancipation of people from power by leaving them to themselves. His strategy was non-cooperation and civil disobedience towards power. His struggle was Satyagraha, and the ultimate goal was Sarvodaya. 
he had made it clear that he was not fighting against Britain or the British people, but his struggle was against colonialism or imperialism, which according to him was criminality against humanity. To quote his own words, in, in spite of my love of the British people, I think that imperialism has been their greatest crime against humanity. Gandhiji's fight was against European civilization, to put it in another expression. He saw European civilization as a combination of imperialism, authoritarianism of knowledge expressed in the form of science and technology, and a wasteful material culture. He took to debunking the Western civilization right at its height, remaining resplendent, confident, and feeling on top of all the world. Gandhiji knew very well that colonization always meant cultural uprooting, and that the colonized would never be able to go back to the pre-colonial condition. Hence, decolonizing efforts would assume two different stances, the non-compromising stand and the compromising one. The non-compromising stand would insist upon restoration of the past culture, restoration of the past linguistic condition, restoration of the past technology and knowledge base. Uh, while uh, the, the non-compromising would also talk about the forceful restoration of people, irrespective of the fact whether people would like it or not. Now, naturally, they become fundamentalists because they wouldn't be able to go back in time and the uh, people wouldn't be following them, and therefore the non-compromising people would become militants as well. Anyway, both the compromising and non-compromising uh, would converge on certain points, uh, points of similarity between the colonizer and themselves. And Gandhiji was actually aware of this. Gandhiji knew very well that India wouldn't be able to go back to the past conditions, uh, neither linguistically nor culturally, the subcontinent would be back to the pre-colonial conditions because the whole subcontinent represented an assembly of multiple unevenly developed cultures and various languages. It was not a subcontinent of any unified cultural setup. So in that case, there was no question of going back to uh, the what, what is called the, the pre-colonial setting. And also he knew very well that in the process of fighting imperialism, the fighters were imbibing certain measures and criteria of a nation to be built up. It was a changed subcontinent that they were conceiving, a changed subcontinent with culture uh, imbued with the passions of democracy and values of secularism, respect for all kinds of cultural formations, starting from those of the ethnic groups to the totally westernized who lived in various pockets. So therefore, Gandhiji thought about India afresh. He never had anything to do with the past as such. But at the same time, he certainly had multiple elements to be borrowed 
and adapt it. Borrowed from the past, borrowed from the past culture, and then adapted for for making people conscious about the nation imagined, making people conscious about a subcontinent to be liberated from the imperialists. So both uh, the conformist and non-conformist elements might be there, but not to be part of anyone, but to be transcending them. So Gandhiji was neither a conformist in decolonization nor a non-conformist about it. Now here you find both among the conformists and non-conformists, the elements of the enemy becoming prominent. Now, for example, take the communalists who sought the colonizers militaristic strategy for communal restoration and building state power of communal exclusiveness. So through freedom, that's what they aimed at. But the, the non-conformists, you take any of the Western educated freedom fighters, perhaps the best one, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, now he conceived India, a, a culture, a subcontinent, a territory uh, to be constituted as completely amenable to modernization. He conceived the subcontinent and its people in the perspective of modern ideas, modern values and, and passions. We cannot say that Gandhiji uh, imagined exactly as construed by Nehru. There was quite a lot of difference, but one can easily see Gandhiji drawing closer to Tagore uh, in the concept of nation, although uh, he was not very articulate about it because the immediate agenda of Gandhiji was to liberate the subcontinent. And in various other features, these are universal features, universal features of humankind, universal features of civilized human society, uh, which would be self-reliant and non-aggressive about natural resources, and sustainable and having properties of high level resilience, etc. In all these terms, one can see Gandhiji's concept of uh, decolonization drawing closer to that of Tagore, uh, rather than closer to anybody else who were his own colleagues and, uh, and, and uh, participants in the freedom struggle. Now, perhaps some of the Sarvodaya workers of the post-independent India might be thinking more or less like Mahatma Gandhi, but the ideas that he, he tried to disseminate all got rather in a codified form in the minds of the Sarvodaya people, and they took them almost like a religion. So there also you find Gandhiji maintaining a distinct position and uh, there you find uh, the conformists themselves forming different from Gandhiji. Therefore, Gandhiji's decolonization never meant taking people to a culture back in time, but beyond the dominant technology and economy of Europe. Many of the thoughts that Gandhiji set down in Hind Swaraj and his later writings almost a century ago persuade us to think seriously about their increasingly profound and prophetic nature. As he prophesied long ago, a wide swath of problems continue to surround the present day world. The technology not going away, consumption 
culture unlikely to reverse globalization rolling on religiosity becoming more compatible with greed militarism so prevalent uh, in various places in asia corruption rampant and environment degrading it is in the form of normative thought on socio political and economic life of india constituted in the light of his empirical experience with the socio economic conditions of india by interpreting through insights drawn from ancient indian thought mainly in the vedas and upanishads epics manu dharma shastra lord buddha and other subsequent systems of thought but to be enslaved by none i think he made use of all these systems of thinking systems of thoughts and ways of life for weaving up a a new framework for uh making the nation up to date in one sense and rather transcending the limitations of the so called up to date world of his times he he never wanted to be follower of a, any of the injunctions embedded in the epics or in in various such writings uh, he found various teachings outside india also relevant the gospels of jesus christ teachings of prophet muhammad moral principles of confucius and the metaphysical thinking of china had provided him insights gandhi and thought appears to have been partly influenced by his foreigners of the west uh we 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 don't find him distancing from philosophers like hegel karl marx engels and so on immense was the impact of works of three writers namely tolstoy the 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 christian anarchist thoreau the american writer and john ruskin the versatile genius gandhi ji was not an intellectual in the conventional sense contrary to a widely held view he was a very well read person he had extensive reading at yarwada jail during 1922-24 uh, uh, he is mentioned to have read 150 titles and speaking on the basis of the archival references that included natural history of birds tom brown school days ramayana the quran uh kipling socrates gathers fast jules uh, um um uh, writings then um uh, gibbons decline and fall of the roman empire tilak gita the upanishads several urdu books and he he is said to have read tagore's sadhana many times max muller's books mirza's ethics of islam kokal chand's rise of sikh power macaulay's history of sikhism uh, dada chand ji's avesta kishor lal's buddha and mahavira banarshas man and superman walter scott's ivan ho arl stevenson's doctor jekyll and so on the list goes on like that it was during gandhi ji's days as a prisoner in the aga khan palace again in pune during 1942 uh, he seems to have familiarized himself with karl marx's writings in mahatma gandhi the last phase written by pyarelal gandhi ji's devoted secretary refers to a lively and in-depth discussion 
on the Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. Gandhiji said to parallel that he could have written Marx better than Marx himself if he had his scholarship. Uh, perhaps he, he might have been joking. One could see the smiling face of Gandhiji saying that. But he meant certain deeper things by saying that. Because he criticized Marx for making certain very important things unnecessarily complicated. According to Gandhiji, the sum and substance of Communist Manifesto or Das Kapital uh, was simple, but Marx made it complicated following the uh, Western style of theorization. There, you can have a, a bright light about Gandhiji's idea of not only idea, idea and extent of decolonization which should take place in the independent India. With the theoretical assertion of Marx, uh, it insisted historicizing almost as an analytical precondition for theorization and explained every fundamental change about human affairs and social processes on the basis of materialistic causation uh, as the, the ultimate instance. It is necessary to be aware of the fact that Gandhiji did not propound any systematic theory as such. Now, I think it was a, a purposeful a strategy adopted for distancing intellectually from the Western heritage, Western heritage in the domain of intellectual contributions. Now, whatever phenomenon he analyzed, now his, uh, uh, his intellectual depth was certainly uh, on a par with what the Western thinkers arrived at. Gandhiji's intellectual approach seems to be a combination of both realism and idealism. But while talking about realism, he was trying to distance himself from Karl Marx. And also while thinking about idealism, he was distancing himself from Immanuel Kant and Hegel. So very often, Gandhiji used the method of eclecticism as a modern uh, critique of philosophy would say. Now, his was a fusion of empirical pragmatism with metaphysical idealism. Gandhiji was a Western educated, accomplished political leader of Renaissance enlightenment exposed deeply to the intellectual spirit and sobriety of European knowledge, but only to establish a relationship of encounter with the entire legacy of the European civilization. And nevertheless, Gandhiji's process of knowing was uh, in, in one sense as deep and realistic as what many Western writers with whom he had uh, some kind of uh, some kind of friendship, intellectual friendship. And uh, in, in his understanding, uh, you you find the the same depth, but th there is, a, a difference, a difference about it, not only in uh, articulation, not only in communication, but in the very structuring of the knowledge, in the very structuring itself. It was a deeply analytical process based on a posteriori reasoning, that is, critically revisiting the a priori judgments. He was 
not accepting anything empirically given as true he was able to distance himself from the knowledge that he acquired once as an an object to be analyzed further it's in that sense we consider him uh, an a posteriori uh, thinker what is strikingly significant about gandhi ji's uh, knowledge is that he converted his knowledge uh, at the level of communication as experiential learning uh, based on his own experiences experiential learning in life or uh, everything as or autobiographical maybe for communicative power but he always called his knowledge as resulting resulting from experiments with the truth in his life rather than mere logical procedures and nothing to talk about the experimentation which the westerners accepted as the ultimate strategy of establishing veracity with the theoretical assertion of mask uh, marx uh, if you uh, compare gandhi ji's ideas you can see amazing kind of convergence of both marx was utterly impatient of capitalism and and he called the working class to uh, overthrow it and and told them that there was nothing for them to lose but only chains but that was not uh, the thing that he put up in his theory das capital doesn't talk about it it's seen only in communist manifesto so where you find marx out of the western framework of comprehension and western rigor of logical consistency uh he draws closer and closer to gandhi or it would be better to say that gandhi ji drew closer to marx out of the library marx out of his text out of his thesis where he was confronting the immediate reality immediate reality is like his father put behind bars and many children dying dying in london uh being used at the edge of the smoke cleaner stick and children getting converted into solidified black carbon and and, and things like such reports had certainly uh provoked marx and he then openly uttered why should we worry about the theoretical collapse of capitalism in theory he said capitalism contained the seeds of its own destruction but capitalism would last until it exhausts the entire possibilities of the socio economic system the mode of production or the social formation that was the theory but out of the library out of his thesis theory he was thinking that why should human beings wait like that the the whole globe would be destroyed by this economy and should people wait until that that was the kind of attitude now gandhi ji also had the same feeling then marx was impatient of state and marx was an anarchist out and out gandhi ji was an anarchist too but marx thought that once there is a socio economic change of radical kind the state would wither away now gandhi ji understood it in a non theoretical way as state something uh, uh turning as utterly useless for people to govern themselves so he thought about the choice of people people withdrawing from the state and living as villagers now here you find gandhi ji and marx converging each other marx talked about uh, the commune which was 
totally different from the cosmopolitan city. Cities did not exist in Marx's concept of the commune. And there is an interesting uh, uh, similarity between the commune and the Grama Suraj. Now, one is certainly tempted to say on the basis of Pyaralal's description of the Communist Manifesto concepts to Gandhiji and Gandhiji's conviction of conviction of the the, the concept of commune. But he was immediately thinking about something that was right in hand, accessible. That was Indian village. And he thought that it would be possible for the independent India to return to villages. And that's what uh, Umarapa tried to demonstrate in front of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru by going to the assembly hall in a bullock cart. Anyway, uh, that was quite symbolic of and also talking quite a lot about the feasibility, sustenance and resilience of the economy that the nation should build up that apart. Anyway, Gandhiji was very clear that there would be a situation exactly as construed by Marx where people would be returning to the villages. In other words, we would soon find the entire globe walking backward to both Gandhi, uh, Marx point of convergence. The world will have to march back to the point where Marx and Gandhi would be there to receive the world. Now, anyway, that shows the, the level of uh, decolonization the colonized countries should undergo. Now, as many writers I mentioned earlier uh, understood, a colonization was not an easy thing. Colonization would require uh, total change, but that wouldn't mean going back to the past, but at that place, a renunciation of many things, renunciation of the unsustainable and then acceptance of that which is to be constructed as sustainable and resilient. Gandhiji was against calling uh, his notions as part of any theory. He had no habit of acknowledging theories. He never uh, accompanied his text with the footnotes. All these he purposely did, perhaps. He wanted to be away from the epistemological decency of the West, epistemological parameters of the West. And you find Gandhian knowledge, therefore, in the light of Western epistemology, just ontological. Gandhiji's understanding is ontological. And therefore, a, a serious epistemologist would criticize Gandhian ontology, uh, having the lurking danger of uh, getting lost into fascism. It is very difficult to sustain ontology without some kind of essentialism. So ontology as an object of knowledge would remain amenable to epistemological scrutiny. And epistemological scrutiny would either turn ontology into knowledge or dismiss it. And an ontology that refuses to face out would certainly be part of fascist notions. And this is what uh, various thinkers uh, uh, try to analyze, not uh, in relation to Gandhi, uh, but in uh, relation to ontology as such. Because in the in the hierarchy of understanding, you find multiple ontologies getting constituted, and and according to the Western logic, you just cannot accept one ontology or the other without being uh, licensed by the epistemological parameters. 
in epistemology every ontology would remain subordinate to the epistemologically uh, epistemologically uh, established knowledge form called science so any knowledge form even today is subordinate to what is called science and and gandhi ji had certainly no objection uh, in accepting science of that pure kind but you find science uh, as a knowledge system of authority authenticity universal credibility and 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 so on and gandhi ji could see very well that the authoritarian kind of knowledge with the mask of science going as handmade of capitalism and imperialism and therefore he expressed his reservations against science and technology only in that sense uh, it's extremely important to think how uh, and and uh, why gandhi ji sought to remain rooted in tradition but tradition that he constructed all by himself one might be able to see the elements of construction elements of constitution drawn from the the written traditions he was not a researcher in the past of india he was trying to understand the fundamental elements of what is uh, in nehru's definition indian culture now uh, gandhi ji understood very well that there wasn't anything called indian culture but there were writings writings that transcended the territorial limits of india the uh, the boundary of the emerging nation whatever it is so he uh, uh, ferreted out some elements of that kind and then constituted his his own um imagined society imagined territory imagined culture and so on so gandhi ji seems to have consciously avoided the european mode of thinking uh mode of organization of thought and uh, structuring of knowledge in terms of theories and so on as i already pointed out uh and he didn't want to identify his ideas as part of any philosophy uh, you all know that he never wanted to be known after gandhism and he ref he refuted to be a propounder of a philosophy and so on but that's what marx also said marx marx made it very clear that he was the person to be marxist the last gandhi ji had refused to accept the western uh, knowledge as such because he found western knowledge in its highest form called science uh, as i said earlier uh, communicating not truth about knowledge uh, but much much more the authority of it the authenticity of it with the result people always took the authenticity and authority of science rather than understanding what science embodies now one is temp tempted to identify and label the features and dynamic of gandhi's knowledge resulting from uh from his political encounter with the western civilization in toto western civilization in its entirety he was establishing a relationship of confrontation with that and establishing a position face to face here you find the difference between the other decolonizing leaders writers intellectuals and gandhi ji now for example you take pandit jawarlal nehru was certainly establishing a relationship of confrontation with the west but for political emancipation he was very much a modernized leader and he was influenced by modern thoughts he was a typical cambridge 
product in 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 politics he was a socialist he was a republican so he was not uh, thinking about india as construed by gandhi ji gandhi ji was different gandhi ji uh, gandhi ji never allowed himself to be swept off swept off by the western current instead he positioned himself facing it in the process of which he was able to acquire the dynamic of the the dynamic of uh, western uh, civilization the entire power of the western uh, civilization uh, could be uh, absorbed by him but facing it this was not the case with many a leader uh, of the freedom struggle or the later statesmen uh, you you find all of them drifting along with the current of modernity they were all swept off or as happens in the case of colonialism anywhere they were go, they were all uprooted and naturally they all got modernized completely gandhi ji was also a thoroughly westernized and modernized person but the difference is that in the process of colonization he was able to transcend the limitations of this kind he he was able to objectively realize this situation of modernity converting uh, oneself into modern subjectivity or into a modern subject which gandhi ji intentionally refused he never wanted to be subjectified by the west and it was for that he evolved various strategies including any an imagined culture of india and imagined indianness gandhi ji's insights into consequences of the western material culture based on industrial science and technology education and health care uh, understanding of the natural resources what not everywhere you find insights of gandhi ji remaining uh, least uh, outdated and that is very clear from uh, his political position and strategies and also how his political position and strategies are being reappraised today he was well aware of the colonizing power of western knowledge system and western education and its enormous potential to facilitate imperialist expansion through the cultivated minds the educated minds the minds uh, ready to accept the western model gandhi ji was first to realize that education was a very powerful institution of the colonial power the imperialist power because that was preparing children to be a uh, harmless conformists but it was not all together in in that line because it was out of western education uh, gandhi ji himself was able to constitute gandhi ji in himself or mohan das mohan das karamchand gandhi became gandhi ji thanks to modern western education anyway his success was that he remained skeptical about western knowledge which means through western education he was able to understand western civilization western material culture in its entirety and was able to go beyond that that is the success of gandhi ji or in the context of decolonization that's what we see very important gandhi ji's thoughts indicate a distinct approach to a variety of issues that we face today and all all these as a prophet he was able to 
uh, indicate he was not acting as a prophet or uh, anybody was not prophesying. He just wrote according to him. Uh, he uh, he uh, believed that the Western lifestyle would globalize. He didn't use that term globalization would it would uh, make worldwide and uh, uh, there you know, people would be greedy. People would be extremely aggressive about using natural resources and there would be no end to it. Uh, similarly, he believed that it's every person's natural right to satisfy his or her subsistence as well as survival needs such as food, clothing, shelter, health care, education, recreation and so on. Now in his famous speech at Moore Central College in 1916, Gandhiji expands his ideas differentiating economic progress from real progress, the former denoting material advancement without limit and the latter moral progress. It is there, he said, there is enough on the earth to satisfy human, de human needs, but nothing to satisfy human greeds. He was not against the use of even the most advanced. Uh, uh, yeah, I was saying that uh, uh, he was not against advanced science and, and technology, so long as they would satisfy the basic needs of humankind. That was the primacy uh, question. What he insisted and reinsisted was that when technology advances, uh, there should be consensus of the poorest or the poor for it. Similarly, when science advances, there should be a better answer for universalizing resilience with assurance of sustainability. This, uh, uh, it is with this uh, concept he resisted the Western civilization, Western material culture. He saw uh, ruination. Uh, knocking at the English gates and then to spread to all the European countries. Uh, according to him, civilization in the in the real sense of the term consists not in the multiplication of human needs, but human liberation out of out of that. Uh, to be voluntary, uh, uh, to be voluntary, uh, uh, I mean, to be accepting voluntarily the position with limited wants. Way back in 1909, Gandhiji had pointed out that the Western model of economic prosperity as a uh, prosperity was a threat to the planet and its resources. Exactly what Karl Marx also uh, says in his uh, manifesto. Uh, Gandhiji preferred to instill through non-violence moral strength in the minds of people who, uh, who are greedy, selfish and not willing to help others and thereby help them convert themselves into the uh, apathetic and convert them to the empathetic. Their apolitical apathetic uh, position was consequence of westernization which he wanted to convert into a position of empathy it's clear that he was thinking about decolonization of the total kind now gandhiji insisted upon maintaining a balance at the same time between economic growth and moral development through a shift from maximization and centralization of uh, central uh, uh, from uh, you know uh, from a, a shift from maximization and centralization to
to optimization and decentralization. Now, all these are still becoming important goals for the modern world. So you, you have to take this as very important that all these were ideas put across by him in the context of Indian independence movement. When he was leading the struggle, he was airing all these ideas. Now we have to piece them together to see the kind of decolonization Gandhiji uh, was having in mind. Now this would uh, uh, see naturally uh, uh, help us critically reflect upon what is going on uh, going on today. Are we uh, are we uh, uh, witnessing a non-conformist kind of decolonization, uh, deliberately uh, taking efforts to put the nation back to the pre-colonial passions, values, and ideas? Or is there a serious debate across this? But sometimes we find a lot of people for uh, various uh, interests of uh, the contemporary value joining the, the power, forgetful of the implications and consequences. Even there are many scientists who, who just ignore various other things. They wear the mask of tradition, mask of culture, mask of uh, the heritage of wisdom and so on. It is true that there existed knowledge, but knowledge already converted into a different kind of system because of the colonial uh, uprooting. It's very difficult to go back to it. It is not even that. Even before that, the knowledge uh, was not as it was given. You, you find various systems of knowledge coexisting and interacting, confronting and entering into conflicts in the subcontinent uh, if you go to the past. Now, you find as far back as 400 AD, uh, there was a major conflict between the Upanishadic thinking and then the Bhagavada kind of thinking. Bhakti that uh, existed and then the Nirguna Parabrahma concept also that existed, nothing to do with the concept of God. Various Upanishads never uh, uh, conceived the idea of God. They talked about universal power, universal consciousness, and every living um, objects as part of the universal consciousness and so on. Metaphysical in nature, but at the same time, talking about certain phenomena, uh, which contemporary people were not able to understand. Therefore, they converted expressions like Aham Brahmasmi, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, Pratnyanam Brahma, and so on, as Mahavakyas. Tattu Masi as Mahavakya. There are Mahavakyas, and all these Mahavakyas were freely used by the later Bhakti scholars just to communicate the idea that there is, I mean, there was only one God. There was no discussion of God at all in all these. So the very conversion of some of the uh, philosophical uh, or see, dense metaphysical utterances into highly simplified theistic utterances was a, a major transformation. I'm talking about a transformation of culture uh, far back in time. Nothing to talk about the uh, transformation, adaptation, and then uh, adjustment of the past culture as understood by the Orientalists of the time, the 19th century Orientalists. What Max Muller understood was put across in his volumes. And when students understood 
the culture and uh, knowledge systems through Max Muller's writings. Now they were only internalizing what Max Muller had approximated uh, to his own understanding, his own experiences. So that was colonization, which uh, uh, Ngugi uh, Thiango or uh, uh, Franz Fanon or Chinu Achebe discussed. So this was such a, a deep rooted process and Gandhiji was aware of that. Gandhiji uh, therefore thought about uh, a, a, an assembly of people or a life uh, to be represented by India uh, uh, as a demonstration of limitations of the Western understanding, the Western civilization. It is that kind of uh, effort in progress, even among the so-called secularists of our time, nothing to talk about the communalists. It, this is uh, the kind of critical self reflex, uh, critical self uh, uh, reflection or self criticism that a, every Indian should undertake consciously uh, during the year, during the 75th year of decolonization. We have on the one side history and then we have on the other side history of knowledge and then Gandhiji belonging to neither. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank you, Professor Gorakal, for this insightful and in-depth, uh, you know, lecture. Like always, we'll take a few questions. Yeah. Uh, those who have questions can uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself, or you can also type in your question in the chat box. I can read them out. Silence worries me because <laughs> it, the lecture fell flat. Uh, there is a comment by Devjani in the chat box. Hello, Professor Gurukul. So good to hear your talk. There's a comment. Yeah. There used to be some debaters in IAC. <laughs> uh, but this time, I was. So there's a question by Devjani. Um, can you suggest some critical editions of the Upanishads that would help us understand the metaphysical discourses better? Uh, yeah, now uh, uh, I, I cannot suggest any uh, particular author, but uh, 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 if you search for English translation, you will get, but uh, I, I'm not prescribing. There are some uh, particle physicists and theoretical physicists who have taken excerpts, particularly they have focused on the Mahavakyas I said. Uh, okay. One is uh, uh, Lijof Capra, and, okay. and famous particle physicist Penrose, uh, who wrote on uh, quantum consciousness. Capra, you said his name was Capra? Capra. Capra, okay. -R -A. Lijof, L I J O F T, if I remember correctly. And then okay. Um, uh, Irwin Schrodinger. Schrodinger uh, <laughs> quotes from the Ishavasya uh, yeah. as the, the beginning statement in some of his papers. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Any any other suggestions? Any anything that could help um, navigate the Upanishad in a way that you know, that we are not reading it through someone else's lenses? Uh, the, the best way is uh, to read Shankara, Shankara's Mahabhashya. Okay. This translated, you just look for the English translation of uh, Shankara's Mahabhashya. And then uh, we have certain uh, English translations, uh, for example, Matilal uh, 
uh, professor of philosophy. He right. Has, Matila yes. has written extensively on that. Yes, yes. B.K. Matilal, yes. yes. I, I have actually looked at that book, but yes. maybe get back to it, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I don't want to hog your time. It was but, wonderful. Yeah. It was so good to see you. Share your email uh, with with us. Uh, I can I can send a, a reading list. I, I'm not able to recall immediately. Even no sorry. problem. I yeah. will do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. Uh, there's a question by Mohit in the chat box. When we say Gandhiji imagined his own idea of India, so could one argue that Indian or Gandhian uh, nationalism was constructed? Uh, yes, yes. Nationalism was certainly a construct because India was borrowing uh, the concept of nationalism from the West, no doubt about it. We had a spontaneously evolved uh, uh, feeling called nationalism in various regions. And, and that happens when, anthropologically speaking, the kinship structure disintegrates or the tribes and clans uh, get fragmented into families and uh, they, they coexist. And then a new economy comes in, new division of labor and so on. So that kind of uh, major restructuring of a community would lead to uh, imagine uh, themselves as an assembly of diversity and an assembly of multiple features. So any, any such uh, area of economic development would naturally have the tendency to imagine a, a region of their own. This is how from family and people, uh, people shift the notion of their place into territory. It is a territorial uh, implication of people's existence when people uh, become very well developed like this. Otherwise, most people would be pastoralists and would be driven by uh, the resources rather than geographical uh, features and, and uh, so on. When geographical features, geographical delimits become important, then people glorify that, they uh, celebrate them, and then the territory is born. But within the geographical limits, you have uh, diversified people, stratified people, uh, some hierarchy, sometimes heptarchy, all these would be there. And then people automatically, for their uh, safety, uh, uh, imagine a well-protected territory. This, and this is first expressed in historical novels. Uh, Walter, Walter Scott uh, theoretically this very much. And, and also uh, various other, uh, uh, other thinkers. Uh, and, and uh, you find everywhere in the country also in India, a regional novelist coming up with uh, a passion for local uh, kings and ruling families. And you find nationalism sprouting first like that. But when a big movement came, uh, it was, it was uh, indispensable for the freedom fighters to conceive a, a new nation dedicated to the proposition that it would be a democratic, it would be republican, and it would be secular. That is imagined thing. And Frederick, uh, Frederick uh, Anderson uh, talked about uh, nation as imagined community. And the famous writer Homi Baba talked about nation as narration. That nation is narrated in the form of novel diversities, diverse characters belonging to different cultures and different languages, all kinds of things. So nation is a, a making in um, a, a making uh, corresponding to the socio-economic and political development. There is a, another question. Yeah. By Kavita Kumari, um, can we assume that European knowledge had come to India through Gandhi? Uh, knowledge came through Europeans themselves. 
because Europe is very interested in studying India's past, and uh, the scholars like uh, Colebrook and uh, even John, a large number of people, they brought ideas about uh, history itself. I, uh, as part of the colonial project of mapping the geography, they brought geography to India as uh, narrating the the narrating the empire of uh, uh, Britain, they brought uh, the method of writing history. All these were colonial, and then out of this, uh, Indian intellectuals wrenched themselves away from uh, the, the shackles to constitute what is called India. But what I am saying is uh, that level of decolonization was. Uh, very, very elementary compared to uh, what Gandhiji had in mind. Gandhiji, Gandhiji viewed India, which is totally different from what any of the statesmen could conceive. And, and, and think about the way we conceive <coughs> India today, or think about the, uh, the dominant perception of the country. Yeah, and, and and you take uh, uh, the the difference in terms of uh, elements of the West involved in them. Although apparently there would be various things, but it is totally different when uh, juxtaposed to the Gandhian concept of nation or Tagorean concept of nation, which was universal, of course, but Tagore uh, was not interested in a geographically limited uh, uh, nationalism, but Gandhiji certainly had the uh, the project in mind because he wanted to go ahead of Europe uh, with a model replicable everywhere. He was like Marx, able to see the collapse of Western materiality and uh, imperialism, uh, and then there should be a more ideal kind of situation, and that he thought. India would practice. Is there any last question? I think there are no more questions. Uh, so we'd like to close yeah, the lecture today. Thank you, Professor Gurukul. This was a very fitting lecture in the 75th year of India's independence, where That's we right. need to take stock of the country and the idea of nationalism. Thank you so much. We hope to hear from you again very soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, sir. Shall I take leave? Yes. Thank you.